Imagine if people could actually share their feelings. I think that would lead to a more beautiful world in which we would not want to hurt each other, but we would really use the new superpower to create a better world, a more connected world. My name is Neo Mohsenwand and I'm in the Media Arts and Sciences program at MIT. And I work on brain decoding and understanding human memory. So my project idea started from a couple of years ago when I started recording my brain waves and recording my life at the same time. I was studying memory, how it forms and how recall works in the brain, how we remember things. And um, in the process, we realized that if we use advanced artificial intelligence on the brain recordings, and if we stimulate the brain in the right way, we might be able to build mind-reading devices. We started calling the project Deep Neurofeedback. So deep comes from the use of deep neural networks and the fact that we are looking at deep features in the brain activity. And neurofeedback means any system that takes the brain activity and shows it to the user in a meaningful way, sort of giving feedback to the person. And it's shown that uh, neurofeedback systems are very useful. They can um, be used for therapy or for gaining more insight about the brain. But recently, because we had some successes about um, taking the brain activity and turning it into pictures, we have started calling the project Insight sort of insight, if that makes sense. So there is a very important distinction between recording the brain and reading the mind. Well, if you just look into the brain, you will see it is waves and spikes and blood and neurons and cells and bone and liquids. So there is nothing like what we think about when we think about mind. But when we talk about mind, mind is filled with thoughts and perception of objects and people and feelings and um, music and voice and all of these other things. So to understand what's going on in the mind, we should actually understand the world because the content of the mind is about the world. So what we realized uh, while we were working on this project uh, was if you want to build an algorithm that can read the mind or translate the activity of the brain into what we think of the mind, the algorithm should really understand the world. It should know what people talk about, what are the important topics, what are the important stories, and so on. So, I have lost a couple of people to Alzheimer's disease. And I've seen how the human mind gets deteriorated due to the loss of brain tissue. And I always thought it would be so amazing if I could talk to these people before they got the disease, before they lost their memories. So the way we normally learn about people's experiences is by asking them, by talking to them. Or recently, due to advancements in mobile devices and cameras, we can see their recordings and things like that. But what if you could remember something or think about something and a machine would take your brain activity, the little video that we play in our head, and turn it into a video outside, into a digital video that you could show to other people. This is what I'm imagining. This is what I'm remembering. And um, although it is, it looks like it looks like absolute science fiction. I I am completely aware that something like that would have a lot of implications. But uh, I think this is the right time to work on it. We have the right algorithms, we have the right devices, and we are getting uh, ever so slightly closer and closer to realizing this dream. So all brain decoding projects start with stimulating the brain. 
I don't mean like putting electrodes in the brain, just showing the user some video or playing some music so that we can understand how their brain responds to that stimulus. After we collect this uh, sort of the brain activity corresponding to different kinds of stimulus, we'll feed it to an artificial intelligence, um, some kind of algorithm. And that algorithm learns to interpret the brain waves in terms of the stimulus. So after the training has happened, we can now read the brain activity and produce videos, produce um, music, all kinds of stimulation. So to perform brain decoding, normally you need some kind of display that uh, sort of presents the stimulus to the user. For example, a monitor that plays the video. And also you need um, a sensor that measures brain activity, which in most of the projects in the past, people have used uh, MRI, especially functional MRI. Um, but we are using EEG, electroencephalography, like, uh, which means like uh, brain waves. And uh, you also need a machine that can run the AI, run the algorithm, which normally with the algorithms that we use, you require a GPU, a graphical processing unit. So putting all of these together gives you one brain decoding system. Show the signal with display, record the brain activity with the EEG headset, process the information with the GPU. So uh, there are a few differences between the way we are uh, trying to do brain decoding than other projects. Most important one is uh, we don't show natural pictures and nat natural audio to the user. We show them something that is already imagined by an AI. So imagine a machine that has seen the world, has understood the world, and is even capable of imagining new scenarios, new animals, new uh, buildings, uh, new pieces of music. But why, why do we use that? The main reason is because these machines are very, very controllable. We can precisely control what the user sees, exactly how long it takes, what are the little details. So we, we get to fool the brain into thinking that you're seeing a dog, but it is really not a dog. It's just a few numbers. And once you experience that, like experience seeing a dog, your brain is going to produce a particular pattern. Then we take the pattern, we associate it with those few numbers that were used to generate that picture. That's like one important difference. Another important difference is we're using EEG. EEG is traditionally thought to be really, really bad for this kind of purposes. EEG is normally used for uh, either understanding uh, sleep stages or epilepsy, or like uh, in general, extreme brain activity, when like brain's activity completely changes. Um, it's never used for refine the details. So the reason we are capable of doing that is because we're using completely new algorithms and we have uh, recorded a lot of data. Normally in EEG experiments, the largest data sets that exist from a single user will extend to a few hours whereas we are going up to 100 hours of recordings. And we think that amount of data consistently from one user in the exact same setup uh, with the exact same algorithm might unlock something that we've never seen before. We've been doing a lot of different kinds of experiments. So we have recording experiments, we have generation experiments, we have imagination tasks. So each of them come with different challenges. In recording, we really want to get the most consistent kind of data. So everything should be perfectly measured and perfectly consistent. So we have to have the exact same space, the exact same amount of light, uh, the program that is displaying the information should be very, very consistent. And uh, all of this has to be very coordinated. Like 
the data gets generated, it gets displayed to the user, and then the hardest part is recording the data. EEG is very, very unstable. But the tiny motion of the body, the signals get disturbed. I mean, like one of the hypotheses that we have is that if you have enough recordings, if you have, if your data set is large enough, then uh, or your AI can eventually even learn to ignore those little disturbances and like put things together in a, in a nice way. So getting all of this um, work together is, is a real challenge. So we had to learn the pr principles of sensing, like how do we like sense the body in a like, consistent way. And we had to learn a lot of computer vision and artificial intelligence. And we even had to build a little tent, like create a little environment which remains consistent. Even the smell of the environment, the, the audio that you're hearing, because if, if any of these uh, factors change, Basically, this is changing your experience, so we're going to get different data. So we are living in a time where more than 50% of the people are diagnosed with a textbook psychological disorder, like some mental disease or mental problem. So already being normal means being in the minority. And this is a huge problem. It means like the, w the world that we have built disturbs our minds. And um, we don't really have a way of measuring the mind. So just imagine a scenario where you go to a psychotherapist, like you sit there and you start talking about your problems. Uh, who knows, maybe the, the mental problem you're suffering from actually disturbs the way you talk about it like you're not going to be honest about it or you're you might not even be able to express it correctly and then a, a psychotherapist who potentially was trained for four years in a college or maybe like a little bit more and has seen a few patients uh, has to come up with a decision for your life i personally know people who made horrifying uh, decisions while they were on psychiatric uh, drugs. So you basically give your mind to someone who actually doesn't know you to change it. And uh, I think this is terrible. And being able to read the mind or at least provide very good feedback about how the mind is working will open new doors for psychotherapy. We will be able to not only uh, improve the practice of psychotherapy, but, but who knows, maybe we will enable self-therapy. Like right now, a lot of people get help from meditation and uh, from like practices, lifestyle changes that they do it themselves. Like they don't need a doctor to do it to them. So what if I could sit in front of a computer for a few minutes and resolve an issue? Like, I think that is the most pressing application, the first application that I wanted to be out there and help people. So, starting from myself, my dream for myself is to know myself better. Just understand how I work, why I work the way I do, and uh, what is this mind thing in my head. Because uh, we have come to a point where we understand molecules and cells and interactions in the body, but we have no clue, like, what is the mind? Uh, I mean, since Freud, like, coming all the way, uh, cognitive science and psychology, uh, our ideas are still pretty much sort of fantastical theories about the mind. We still don't know what it really is. So that's the first goal, to uh, open a window to the mind and make it studyable, to build this psychoscope, a thing that you look into the mind and try to understand it. And I believe building things like that will increase the, the bandwidth of communication between a person with themselves and a person with other people. So I can dream of a, a, a world in which people are able to communicate feelings people are able to communicate what matters to them, like how, how they feel the world, how they experience the world. And I think uh, initially the superpower that humans had and made them sort of the masters of the world was their language, the fact that two people can talk about very, very complicated abstract ideas to each other 
and uh, sort of that enables collaboration, that enables scaling up the size of the society and like building complicated cities and like space shuttles and so on. So imagine if people could actually share their feelings. I think that would lead to a more beautiful world in which we would uh, not want to hurt each other, but we would really use that new superpower to create a better world, a more connected world. So the most important thing that comes to my mind is that we are trying, but we don't have any guarantee that this will work. But uh, we think it's the right time to try it. So even if we don't succeed, we, we have already learned a lot of things. So lower the expectations, but help us by any means you can. Thank you. <laughs>